This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Want to know what's going on in your neck of the woods and learn the history and the people behind the events that you love across the state? Get to know the real Mississippi. Check out MPB Think Radio's Next Stop Mississippi podcast on all platforms or on the MPB public media app. Good morning and thanks for tuning in. You're listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And today we're going to be talking about lifestyle medicine for better blood sugar. And Kevin and I were talking this morning before the show and we said that's a mouthful. But it it is, but it is also extremely important. And we've talked a lot on the show about diabetes and how you get control of that and how you lose weight and all of these things. Um, But I want to spend today focusing in on specific strategies that we can use to help you get better control of your blood sugar. So if you're newly diagnosed with diabetes or if you've had it for a while and you're still um, trying to optimize your levels, then today's the show for you. And if you have a question or a comment for us, you can always email me fit at mpbonline.org. All right, let's kind of start. I think in order to understand how any of these things that are lifestyle related can make our blood sugar better or help us get better control of our blood sugar, we first have to understand what is making our blood sugar not okay, right? And so from a type 2 diabetes standpoint or a pre-diabetes standpoint, that is insulin resistance. That is what is kind of the underlying situation that is making us have a higher than normal blood sugar. So to understand that, we want to take a little step back and go, well, what's blood sugar, right? So when we eat our food, it gets broken down into the different uh, things that we need in order to run our body. And glucose or blood sugar is vitally important. It is what really runs everything in our body. It um, provides energy for our brain and our muscles and and all the processes that take point part in our body. And so everybody has blood sugar. Sometimes I think that we miss that piece and people just see the word blood sugar and automatically think bad. But everyone has blood sugar right now. If you pricked my finger and got a blood sample, I would have a blood sugar reading and you would too. What we want is to focus on keeping that within a certain range because within that range, our body can thrive. It can do all the things that it's supposed to do. But when it gets too low, our body can't do that. Um, We may lose consciousness. We may um, become sluggish or sweaty or fatigued, those types of things. And when it's too high, that also can do damage to all host of other body systems. So we have a, a range in which we want to keep it. And normally when we eat that food, regardless of what the food is, and it breaks down into those different things, our the sugar will enter into our bloodstream, and then it needs to go from our bloodstream into our individual cells to be used. And that's where our friend insulin comes into play. So insulin is the key to opening the cell so that that sugar can get from just free floating around in our bloodstream into our cells and then be used by all those different organ systems. And so in a normally functioning body that doesn't have any type of insulin resistance, that's what is what happens. Your pancreas releases that insulin, it opens the cell, the sugar goes in there and it goes to, you know, all throughout our body, wherever it needs to be utilized. When we have insulin resistance, the insulin is still released from our pancreas, but when it gets to the cell, the cell is like, nope, uh, I'm not going to let you um, open the door. So there is something that is keeping the insulin from sticking into what we call an insulin receptor. And when we really do a dive into what that is and what is contributing to gunking up that Uh, that uh, uh, lock, it is fatty acids. And those come from things like saturated fats and other things that we eat in our, uh, our diet. And so 
when we can't, when the insulin can't open that cell, our pancreas goes, well, I guess you just need more keys. And so we send more and more insulin to that area uh, to try and overcome that resistance. And that's not good for a variety of reasons. One, our pancreas kind of wears out over time from doing that. But also elevated levels of insulin make us hungrier and make us make us want to eat more. That's why one of the symptoms of uncontrolled diabetes is often hunger. Um, so we have an increased desire to eat. And then when we do that, our blood sugar goes even higher. We send more insulin. And so if I was drawing it as a picture, I would just have a big old circle and a big old cycle going on right now. And so we have to figure out a way to interrupt that cycle or um, kind of shut down this process. And so from a medical standpoint, there are different ways that we can do that, right? And one is through medication. Um, so if you have diabetes, you've probably heard the word metformin before. That is a very common medication that has been around for a very long time. And one of the ways that it works is by um, lowering that insulin resistance so that we're able to utilize the insulin that we already have on board better, right? And then there are a whole host of other medications and uh, many newer medications that we have now as well that work on different components of blood sugar regulation. But we can also use lifestyle strategies to help with that as well. And I don't want us to think of it as an either or type situation. So it's not that we do lifestyle modifications or medicine. Um, it is lifestyle always should be a component of whatever we're doing. And then we can do lifestyle medicine or lifestyle modifications plus medications or plus, you know, surgeries, whatever we're talking about in, in whichever condition. But lifestyle should always be there because we want to help those medications work um, to the best of their ability. And knowing that the insulin resistance is not just about blood sugar issues, right? When we have increased insulin resistance, we can also have problems with our liver and get more fatty liver deposition, which is a whole whole nother ball game and a whole nother show we could do on fatty liver and and how to address that and what it, what it's doing to our body. But it's more than just controlling the blood sugar. It's about controlling the underlying mechanism that is leading us to have a higher than expected um, blood sugar or higher than necessary blood sugar because we want to not just take care of our blood sugar we want to take care of our overall heart health because the number one killer of Americans is heart disease the number one killer of folks with diabetes is heart disease so it's not just about um, addressing the blood sugar it's about addressing your entire cardiovascular system so that you have the, the setting yourself up for the, the best success in terms of controlling your blood pressure and your cholesterol and your blood sugar and really just thriving. So what we're going to talk about uh, during the rest of the show are some very targeted lifestyle strategies to help with this. We're going to focus in, of course, on nutrition because you can't have a talk about insulin resistance and better blood sugar control without focusing on nutrition. We're also going to pick up and talk about some physical activity as well and some really specific things you can do to help with blood sugar control. And you know I'm going to sneak some sleep in there because it is one of my most favorite topics and a powerful tool in helping to work on um, blood sugar control as well as just overall heart health. So those are what we're going to get into today on the rest of the episode. Thanks for joining me this morning here on Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit. I'm your host, Josie Bidwell, nurse practitioner at UMMC. And today we're exploring lifestyle medicine strategies for better blood sugar control. We talked a lot of the sciencey stuff, a lot of what insulin resistance is. And that was important for us to kind of understand why these other things work, because I'm going to tell you how they work on insulin resistance as we go throughout the rest of the show. If you want to give me a call today, if you have a question or a comment, I'd love to do, hear from you today. All right. We did have a question that came in through my email that asked how and when should you check your blood sugar, which I think is a really 
important question because a lot of people are confused about when to do it um, or they're hesitant to do it because it's, you know, poking yourself with a little needle is often not something that people uh, are used to doing and can be very apprehensive about doing it. From a healthcare provider standpoint, the reason we ask you to do that and the reason we ask you to do that at different times is so we can make um, informed decisions about how best to adjust your medications or to adjust your um, lifestyle and your diet, right? So um, the f- kind of first number that we're really interested in, and if you're only going to check your blood sugar one time a day, like you're like, I'll do it once for you, but I'm not doing it anymore, then that first thing after waking up when you haven't had anything to eat for at least eight hours is a really good one, right? And so I I used to say that first thing in the morning blood sugar, but that that's not people don't always sleep that way, right? So if you're a night shifter, whatever, um, it's after you have not had anything to eat for about eight hours, and usually upon awakening, is when we want that, and that we tend to call that a fasting blood sugar, and that just tells us how well your uh, pancreas is doing when it's not being challenged. Right. So because we're not eating, so we're not um, asking our pancreas to do more. It's just kind of the background insulin that is secreted um, uh, all the time, 24 hours a day. So there are different insulins that we can adjust to help address that. There may be different strategies we can do at bedtime with your food or snack choices to impact that. So that fasting sugar is really, really important. And the machines are fancy these days. They will keep it and store it in their in the memory of that. And so that's fine. Remember to bring it to your healthcare provider when you come for a visit if you use if you're doing it that way so that we can scroll through and look. Um, I really still like for patients to write it down um, on a piece of paper or to have um, an app that they keep it in so that we can really see patterns over time. And then the the second time that I like for people to check their sugar is what we call a postprandial. And that is just a big old word for after food, right? After some kind of um, food or beverage, really. And any one of us, if we ate something and then we checked our blood sugar in 15 or 20 minutes, our blood sugar would be rising, right? That's a normal response. Where folks who don't have a problem with um, their blood sugar, don't have insulin resistance or, or diabetes or prediabetes, is after about an hour and a half to two hours, that blood sugar is going to come on back down into the normal range. If we have an insulin resistance problem, it's not going to do that. It was going to stay higher. So optimal timing to check your blood sugar after a meal is about two hours after you start that meal. Right. So you may be thinking that's a lot of finger sticks, right? Like if I got to do it when I wake up and then I got to do it after breakfast and lunch and dinner, that's four times a day. Those strips are expensive and I just don't want to poke myself that many times. And I hear you. Um, What I like to do with patients is alternate the meals. So maybe today I do a fasting and then an hour, you know, two hours after the start of my breakfast. And then tomorrow I'll do fasting and after lunch. And then the next day I'll do fasting and after dinner, right? And by writing those things down and keeping a list of them, I can then start to see patterns of, oh, I'm always high after breakfast or I'm always high after dinner, but my breakfast and lunch is fine. And when you show that to your healthcare provider, then we can pick medications that um, have different kind of peaks and onsets of action to help uh, kind of knock down when you're having those highs instead of just uh, trying to address all of them at one time. Now, my other tip in checking your blood sugar is where where you stick yourself uh, in terms of, you know, on your finger, if you're doing finger sticks. A lot of people I see poke right in that just the meatiest part of their finger. And that's also the spot that has more um, like pain receptors. So it hurts more when you do it right there. So if you are looking at the pad of your finger, the very outsides of it, like the perimeter of that area is going to have less of those pain receptors. So if you stick there, it should be a little less painful. You're still going to feel it, but it should be a little less painful. And then if your machine, the, the, um, 
We call it a lancet, but the little item that you poke your finger with often has a dial on the side, and that is adjusting how deeply it pokes into your finger, right? And so it usually shows up as little blood droplets. And so one little blood droplet would be a very shallow um, kind of poke. And then um, all the way up to the, the biggest blood drop is usually a much deeper stick. And so if I was doing this on like little, uh, little kiddos, I would use probably the little one or the two on that because they have very thin skin. If I was doing this on someone who does a lot of outside work, uses their hands a lot, a lot of construction and has really thick um, skin there, then I may need a deeper stick. But the average adult, I usually set it in the middle. Um, that way we're not getting too shallow of a stick. We're not getting too deep of a stick because the deeper the stick, the more uncomfortable it's going to be. And then going on that outside um, edge of the finger. Those are kind of my tips for less pain and then um, the, uh, the appropriate frequency of sticks. Now, always go by what your individual healthcare provider is asking you to do in terms of your blood sugar measurement. Um, if they want you to check before bedtime, then there is a reason that they have asked you to do that. But that's why we ask you to check at different times of the day. All right, let's talk about nutrition and food and how we can use it to address insulin resistance, right? And most people are going to expect me to say cut carbohydrates, right? And I'm not going to say that. I am going to say balanced nutrition is what we want. But what does that mean? Well, it means that we want to move as much as we can from the standard American diet to a fiber rich diet, which is going to be plant predominant. So let's talk about what the standard American diet looks like. If we think about what we put on our plate, it is usually lower in fruit, lower in veggie, lower in whole grain, and higher in um, fat, salt, and sugar from a variety of reasons. We tend to do a lot of um, animal-based products, even multiple ones at a time. You know, bacon, eggs, grits, toast is a pretty common breakfast, and that's a lot of refined carbohydrate and saturated fat. Right. Um, but it doesn't mean that we have to completely eliminate, eliminate those types of foods and only have a, a vegan or a vegetarian diet. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm talking about is as a pattern. So not the occasional serving of this, but things that we're eating every single day, multiple times of the day. And if we are wanting better blood sugar control, then we have to increase our fiber. And fiber only lives in plant foods, right? So adding more plants to our diet is how we want to go. And the way we approach nutrition in Lifestyle Medicine Clinic is from an addition standpoint, not a subtraction standpoint, which is a little different way of thinking about nutrition. A lot of times we tell, we think, Folks think we're going to tell them what not to eat or what they have to stop eating. And instead, we like to focus on what we should be eating more of. That way, when we start to add things to our diet or add them to our plate, then we kind of naturally reduce some of the things that we we don't want to have on our plate for optimal health or better blood sugar control. So... We talk a lot about swaps. So if you really want toast with breakfast, let's try and swap that for a whole grain option. So instead of a white bread, swapping it for a wheat bread, right? A whole wheat bread. Um, if we want um, some type of warm cereal in the morning or we want cereal, swapping from a frosted flake to an oatmeal, would be a, a better swap in terms of, of fiber, right? Um, if we want pasta, then working on uh, moving from a plain um, white pasta to a whole grain pasta or uh, a lentil pasta, chickpea pasta, one of those types of things that's going to have more fiber in it. Um, and then 
limiting it to one animal at a time. And when I say that to patients, they look at me like, what are you talking about? What is one animal at a time? And so I got lots of cool food models in my clinic. And so I'll say, build me a breakfast, right? Or a lunch or whatever. And I'll have them do that. And I'll say, okay, how many animals do we have going on right now? And a lot of times it's multiple ones. You know, if we think back to the bacon or eggs, we've got both of those going on. Um, And if we add some cheese grits on the side, we got a third little animal sneaking in there from the cheese. Um, If we build a uh, ham and cheese sandwich with mayo, right, we've got multiple animals there as well. Uh, And individually, they're fine, but when we when we make those the focus of our plate and we don't add any fiber, then we wind up with a very fiber deficient meal that is not going to help us in terms of um, insulin resistance or in terms of getting that better blood sugar control. So, you know, I might say something like, well, have you ever thought about switching that mayo for hummus or avocado, right? That's going to get you that creaminess that you like, that a little bit of healthy fats in there, but you're also going to get some fiber on board from that. Or what about having the eggs or the bacon, but not both at the same time. And we always want to add something to the plate when we do that. So if we normally have toast, bacon, eggs, right, we want to switch that toast to a whole grain toast. We want to choose bacon or eggs. And then we want to add something that's going to have fiber in it here. So it's not just about removing one of those proteins. It's about adding something back. So maybe you like scrambled eggs and we add a couple of handfuls of spinach uh, in with that and get some good um, hearty greens and fibers in that way. Maybe the idea of having greens at breakfast just stresses you out. That's okay. Let's add a fruit in there as well. So again, it's not just restriction, it's about adding more, right? So my first kind of tip for moving to a more fiber-rich diet was switching to a whole grain product. So whatever you're doing from a a refined grain product, moving to a whole grain product is is step one. So changing nothing else on your plate but that. Um, The second is choosing one animal at a time and replacing whatever that second or third animal was with um, a fruit or a veggie. The third one is going to be to split your uh, animal in half and add some other fiber rich ingredient, right? So we've talked about it on the show before, but let's say you're making spaghetti, right? And we switch our noodles from a regular um, pasta noodle to a whole wheat noodle. And we cut our ground beef or ground turkey in half. And so instead of a pound of that, we go to a half a pound of that. And then we add the other half of some type of vegetable into that, whether that be onions and peppers and mushrooms, or if we're really trying to make sure we've got plenty of protein on board, maybe that's lentils or some other kind of um, legume that we add to it. But now we're still having familiar meals, right? So not diet food, but we have doubled the amount of fiber that what would have been in that same kind of regular meal that you have. And if you've got picky little eaters, um, you know, think about pureeing that sauce as well, right? So if you're going to do a tomato sauce, think about how you add in some of those veggies like the onions and peppers and carrots and that kind of stuff, but puree them. Um, so that, uh, I don't even like the word hidden. They're just veggie packed without having the texture of veggies if some folks don't like those. And then the next thing is really intentionally trying to make sure that we have beans at at least one meal a day, optimally more than that. And I can hear folks already going, beans make my belly hurt. Right. Um, That is the number one kind of pushback I get on that is, but beans make my belly hurt. And what we're going to explore in this next segment is one, why beans are so important and beans should be part of our daily intake 
and some of my favorite tips and strategies for helping you have a little less a little less belly bloat when you have some of those beans on board. You're listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio, and I'm your host, Josie Bidwell, and we've been talking about lifestyle medicine for better blood sugar today. So if you have a tip that you want to share, something that you've found helpful in getting your blood sugar under control, I'd love to hear it. We were talking about uh, how we move from kind of the standard way of eating, the standard American diet, into a more fiber rich diet, and why that is so important when we are trying to get control of blood sugar. And in the first segment of the show, I talked about insulin resistance and Fiber is very important for helping to lower insulin resistance, as well as when we choose more fiber-rich foods on our plate, we naturally uh, choose less of the ones that are going to have more saturated fat, which can tend to, to drive up those fatty acids in our system which make insulin resistance worse. So that's the strategy behind it. And it doesn't have to be a perfect plate. It just needs to be better, right? A movement from um, one to the other and any addition of a fiber-rich food is a win. So I mentioned beans and legumes before the break and why they're so important, right? One of the reasons I love them is they are full of protein, which someone who doesn't really eat meat like me, I'm always looking for how do I get um, some good quality protein in because it is very important. We don't want to miss macronutrients. And beans fit that bill for me um, because they do have a lot of protein, very low in fat, and are full of fiber. But what about in terms of blood sugar or blood glucose? Um, Because what I hear from a lot of folks when I first start suggesting that is, but those are starchy. And those are going to make my blood sugar go up. Well, let's look at what actually happens, right? We, t- we see when measuring blood sugars in folks that beans and legumes cause half of the blood sugar spike of the same amount of carbohydrates from bread, rice, or pasta, from a refined bread, rice, or pasta, right? So again, we're talking about swapping things. So if I replace white rice with a serving of beans, I should have half of the amount of blood sugar spike. So my blood sugar may rise, but not to the degree that it would with those um, more refined carbohydrates out there. So not all not all carbs are created equal and not all carbs are going to res- uh, cause the same response in our blood sugar. And then what is really exciting about beans, and I'm probably the only person in the world who gets excited about beans, but what's really exciting is something called the second meal effect, right? And What it looks at is how having a meal that has beans or legumes in it, how that not only impacts your blood sugar with that meal, but with the meal following it, right? So the first way they looked at this was to look at a breakfast meal. And they fed um, some folks uh, a a bread-heavy breakfast, and they fed the other group um, breakfast with lentils in it, right? And then they looked at the blood sugar spike. And the, the blood sugar spike was much higher with the bread than with the lentils. And so the same carb content in each one of those, but the lentils spiked the blood sugar less than the bread. Okay, yay, right? What about the next meal? So lunch. So they fed those same two groups of people the exact same lunch, right? And it featured bread, right? Same amount of bread in both meals. And what they saw was that um, the blood sugar spike after that same meal was less in those that had had the lentils for breakfast, Right. So having the bean or legume at one meal caused less of a blood sugar spike at the subsequent meal, even though it had the same amount of carbs in it as somebody else as the the other person's meal. Right. And so you may be thinking, well, I don't want to have lentils for breakfast. That doesn't sound good. Right. Does it impact the next day's meal? And the answer was yes. So they looked at what if we had beans at dinner and then what did breakfast blood sugars look like the next day so they fed um, again somebody a carb rich meal without 
uh, beans in it. And then they fed them the same carb count, but with beans. And then the next morning, we they did a sugary beverage. Like if you've ever kind of drank that sugary syrup that you have to drink when you're pregnant for them to check your blood sugar, they did that. So they, they drank a sugary liquid for breakfast. And the folks who had had the beans the night before, again, had less of a blood sugar spike um, with just that pure sugar breakfast. So having them throughout your day is a really important strategy for dealing with what we call post-meal blood sugar spikes, right? So it's not just about the protein that they have there, but about their overall um, impact on blood sugar as you go throughout the day. And Kevin, you look excited about something. You got a question for me? Well, you've been talking about the beans, so I wonder Mm -hmm. if you could offer some suggestions for us of, you know, which beans and maybe how to work them in on the diet. Yeah, absolutely. And when this kind of second meal effect was first uh, discovered. They called it the lentil effect because that is what they looked at. And But it holds true for others as well. So they've looked at chickpeas and black beans and all of these different kinds of things. So in essence, really it's whatever you like and can afford and are, are willing to try and consume. Um, the number one thing that people um, kind of tell me about beans is is the gas production and how that makes their belly hurt. And that is a very real thing, right? There is um, a sugar or a starch, and we'll go with starch, a starch in beans called oligosaccharides. And that is what causes kind of the bloating and the, and the gas associated with those. Um, there was a study that looked at, are there uh, different amounts of, of gas producing beans, right? Are there some that are better? better uh, for others. And one of the ones that um, that looked at a kind of a comparison of three, they looked at black eyed peas, pinto beans and baked beans, right? And baked beans are usually like navy beans, uh, you know, some kind of white bean there. And within the first week, the black eyed peas actually caused less kind of bloating and discomfort and gas than the other two. But by the end of the month, everything had kind of calmed back down to kind of baseline levels. And what we actually find is you don't necessarily make less gas, you just don't perceive any discomfort or bloating from it. So it just takes a little while to get used to it. And, you know, while I would love to see people eating a cup, a cup and a half of beans a day, we don't got to start there, right? And we probably shouldn't start there, um, especially if you um, you know, are a little bit more sensitive to bloating and gas. I've worked with some patients where we just add a tablespoon of beans in. You know, we just kind of sprinkle them on their salad maybe um, that they're doing so that their body kind of gets used to that and we can, can progress it from there. Um, some of the other tips that can, can be helpful there are soaking those beans. So if you're starting from a dried bean, soaking it and like for a long time you know we tend to think about just like an overnight soak but the longer you soak it the more um, of that kind of starch gets pulled out of there so about 16 hours looks like the the optimal so maybe when you get home from work start soaking those beans so that you can pop them in the crock pot the next day Um, some folks also report that pressure cooking the beans will help with some of that or adding different spices um, like uh, garlic or onions, ginger, kombu, those types of things added to beans. There's a little less uh, scientific research on that and whether that actually does reduce um, the the gas or not. Um, But it's certainly not a bad idea to flavor your food with some non-salt related condiments there. So that could be a strategy Um, as well as um, thinking about Um, just a variety of different types. So when I'm thinking about a breakfast that might have beans in it, right? Like if I know that I normally have a, a spiked blood sugar after lunch, right? And I know that adding beans at breakfast is gonna help with that. You could do hummus, right? You could do a hummus, like a piece of whole grain toast with some hummus spread on it and a piece of fruit on the side. And that would be, again, a well-balanced breakfast that would have beans without thinking about having, you know, a big bowl of beans for breakfast. Um, The same deal at lunch. You know, maybe we're going to have a big taco salad, but instead of putting um, the meat on that taco salad, we're going to throw black beans and corn uh, on top of that 
uh, and have some good fiber that way. Again, some good beans there. And then at supper time, just like that strategy we talked about a minute ago of backing down to half of the ground meat that you usually use and adding the the rest as lentils or um chickpeas or you know some other kind of legume there now we've incorporated beans in three times during that day um, in in a way that doesn't look like just serving a side of beans on, on the side of your plate so you have to you have to get a little bit creative when when you're doing things that way um, some of the other things that can be important in moving to a more fiber rich diet is your grain choice and when we think about grain choice we tend to think about well I need brown rice instead of white rice and that absolutely is appropriate but I want us to start start to think about the particle size, like how big that grain is, right? So if we use oatmeal for an example, and we think about um, an old fashioned oat versus a um, quick oat or an instant oat, the the reason they cook quicker is because they are usually kind of chopped up more. And so the smaller the particle, the easier it's going to be for your body to digest and the quicker it's going to rise your blood sugar. So if you enjoy oatmeal every day and you normally do an instant pack or even the quick cooking pack, it might be worth, you know, investing the additional, you know, five or six minutes to cook the old fashioned oat versus the other two to again, slow that digestion down and prevent that post meal blood sugar spike. You're listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. I'm Josie Bidwell, and we've been exploring lifestyle strategies to help with better blood sugar control. And I was just gushing on about how important beans are and uh, adding those into your diet, not only for good quality protein and fiber, but also for just the amazing um, prevention that they have for blood sugar spikes, um, even after the meal that you have them at. For this kind of last segment of the show, let's spend some time talking about physical activity. And I know I've talked about it a lot on this show. And if you're a regular listener, I hope that you're able to tell me exactly how many minutes of physical activity that you need in a week. But if you're not, it's usually 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity. And that can sound daunting if you are not readily physically active, right? We've also talked about the fact that any movement is beneficial, right? And that's exciting that any amount of movement is good for your health. So if you can't get that 150 minutes, anything counts and we should be doing that. But what about specifically for blood glucose? What does the evidence tell us in terms of physical activity that is good for blood sugar? Well, if we want to stick with how do we get good control of those spikes in blood sugar after a meal, one thing that is really, really cool is that the evidence tells us all we need is a leisurely stroll, right? An after meal stroll. So I call it an after meal stroll for blood sugar control. And it rhymes. And it is important, right? And optimally that would last about 15 minutes but again at a leisurely pace so this is not something where we're going to be trying to break a sweat or get our heart rate up a lot or any of those different kinds of things because I know that that's a barrier during your work day right if you're at work you're thinking well I can't go on my lunch break for a walk because I'm gonna be all sweaty and nasty when I come back but that's not what I'm talking about a nice leisurely stroll um, is excellent for blunting that spike in blood sugar that we see after a meal. So 15 minutes is great, but even if you only have two minutes, right, uh, that's 120 seconds, two minutes of walking after a meal has been shown to reduce the spike in blood sugar by up to 17%. That's a lot. So Thinking about how we can do that, right, that is just after your lunch, getting up and taking a couple of laps around your office, right? Or um, after breakfast, before you get in the car to go to work, you walk down to the end of your street and back, right? Or after supper, before you cut the TV on to have you know, your end of the, the, the night relaxation, if that's how you choose to relax, 
just walk in, you know, walk, maybe do a load of laundry and walk that um, from the, the laundry room back to your room and actually put those clothes up. That's something we struggle with at, at our house. But little pockets of time matter, right? So even if you only have just a couple of minutes, movement after a meal is really, really important. And even if you can't move, so you're like, well, Josie, I can't even do that, right? I, don't, I can't leave my desk after a meal. Standing up counts too. We don't see as much reduction in that after meal spike, but we do see some. So even intermittent standing breaks throughout your day, right? So a couple times an hour, you just stand up for a minute or two can reduce those um, after meal sugars by about 10%, right? So all of these little things add up. We don't have to get that 150 minutes. We don't have to be breaking a sweat, but just either standing up or moving for a few minutes after meal times can be powerfully important in helping you get better control of your blood glucose. In these last few minutes, I want to talk to you about sleep and how sleep impacts your blood sugar. And in particular, how sleep impacts insulin resistance. So a really cool study was done that looked at young, healthy men and what their blood sugar and insulin levels did after just a few days of sleep restriction, right? So they restricted these folks for three days for only four hours of sleep per night. And what they were able to see is a dramatic increase in those fatty acids that I talked about that are so important in driving insulin resistance, that are gumming up that lock on the cell, keeping our insulin from working. So in essence, just three days of a shortened sleep duration made these healthy guys look like they had prediabetes from an insulin resistance standpoint. So think about that over the long haul if you're someone who has a short duration of sleep. If you're sleeping less than seven hours a night and you're struggling to get control of your blood glucose, that may be a significant culprit to what's going on. And we need to work on what the cause of that short sleep duration is, right? Is it trouble falling asleep? Is it trouble staying asleep? Is it both? Is it sleep apnea and we're having trouble wearing the machine or, you know, a a variety of other things? Don't just write it off as something that you have to deal with because there are strategies that we can use to help with whatever is causing that shortened sleep duration and making it a priority is going to be so important for not missing out on something that can really have a dramatic improvement in improving our insulin resistance and in turn lowering our blood glucose which is just good for our heart all the way around. So I hope that I gave you some practical tips that you can put into place in your life or at least have got your your brain working on, man, there are a lot of things out there that I can be doing to work on my blood sugar and just starting somewhere, right? And if you want more information about any of those things that I've talked about today, or you need help getting contacted with a dietitian or any other healthcare provider to help you, just shoot me an email. That's fit at mpbonline.org. If you want to go back and listen to today's show or any of our other shows, you can do that by downloading our podcast. You just search for Southern Remedy on your favorite podcasting app, and that way you never miss an episode. I'd also encourage you to tune in every weekday at 11 for the full Southern Remedy lineup. Again, you've been listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.